The text for our sermon this morning is based on Matthew chapter 13, verse 17. Blessed are your eyes, for they see. One of the wonderful things about the teachings of the new church is that they literally change the way we think. They're not simply good ideas or useful suggestions. They're not a new flavor of religious philosophical thought that's offered as a complement to all the other religious flavors that are out there. No, they're much more than that. New church teachings are the product of a new revelation, which means they cause seismic shifts in our thoughts and attitudes in our wants and needs and desires, in our hopes and dreams. So one of these profoundly important ideas is this, that we are all spiritual beings who happen to be walking around in natural bodies. In other words, our spirit is in the driver's seat, not our body. Our spirit determines everything about us, what we say and do right now, what we think and feel right now, whether we smile or frown, whether we wish to be helpful or unhelpful, whether we choose to believe or not believe. And the point is our body is not making these decisions. It is our spirit. And so when it comes to our eyes, Our spirit is choosing for us what to look at. Drawing our attention to certain things and pushing other things to the periphery. So the way we look at the world around us and the people in it has everything to do with what we love. Two people can look at the exact same object and notice vastly different things. An engineer and an artist could both be looking at one of the great pyramids in Egypt, but focus on completely different things. The trained eye of the engineer notices the design and the lines and the structure and the materials of the pyramid, whereas the trained eye of the artist takes in the whole scene, the contrast between light and shade, views the pyramid against the backdrop of the yellow sand and the blue sky. There's the mixture of colors and tones. Or take two astronomers who can spend a lifetime studying the starry universe. One concludes that there is a God, and the other concludes that there is no God. So our eyes focus on the things we love. And as a result, our worldview tends to be based on what we've trained our eyes to look at. Well, we're all familiar with that phrase that the eye is the window into the soul. There's a lot of truth to that. You think about the eyes and they reveal so much. You really can get a glimpse of a person's spirit just by looking in their eyes. The eyes reveal loves, good loves, bad ones. We talk about sad eyes and happy eyes, or angry, or kind, or patient, or impatient eyes. And to a degree, eyes can even convey what we're thinking. I'm sure you've had that experience with children, or maybe even adults, and you look in the eyes and there's either innocence or guilt. I was struck a number of years ago by an eye doctor who claimed when shining that extremely bright light into the back of the retina that he could tell the overall health of his patients just by looking at the back of the retina, at the blood vessels and the way things go. That's what a trained eye apparently can do just by looking in the eye. Well, as you know, in the the new church, 
we are given a whole lexicon of correspondences. But perhaps the easiest one to understand and come to terms with is that of the eye. Throughout the teachings of our church, the eye corresponds to understanding. And we even use it in our everyday language. I see what you are saying. One teaching says the eye is the most noble organ of the face because it, quote, communicates more directly with the understanding than any other sensory organ. And so we find that there are general principles. We have what you could call good vision when truths of the word are the lens through which we view the world and other people. And we have poor vision when human intelligence and pride is the lens through which we view the world and other people. When it comes to our spiritual growth and development, the principle of seeing what we need to see versus what we want to see becomes a more urgent matter if we want to be able to see as the Lord sees. So, in our reading from Matthew today, the Lord spoke about how it's possible to see, but not really see, and how we can be blind to the truth, even if it's staring us right in the face. Now, there are all sorts of hidden reasons for this. Sometimes we're just simply preoccupied, thinking about something else, and we miss something important. Sometimes we're tired or busy, and we miss important cues, signals in body language of those we love, our children, loved ones, and friends. And then sometimes we miss seeing important things because we lack the compassion, the sensitivity to love one another as the Lord has loved us. And so the Lord sometimes uses parables because seeing we do not see. For example, the Lord gave the famous parable of the Good Samaritan because sometimes this is how people need to be able to see the truth. And that sometimes we lack the love, the compassion to be empathetic toward the plight of others and symbolically walk by on the other side. That is, turn a blind eye to those who are right in front of us who need our care and attention. So yes, we can miss a lot of things going on right in front of us. But here's the beautiful thing. The Lord has also given us the ability to train our eyes to see differently. Just like anyone in a profession who spends many, many years training in their particular skill and craft, spiritually, the Lord gives us tools to train our eyes to see differently. I want to mention quickly, a couple of years ago, I remember watching a documentary about coyotes and how they are infiltrating the neighborhoods, built up neighborhoods. And these things are crafty little animals because the person giving the interview was talking to the scientist and they were standing by a playground and there were these mums with their children playing, the children playing there. And the scientist was saying that these coyotes know how to walk around your vision, just on the edge of your peripheral vision. And so the cameraman swung out, and sure enough, as they were talking, there were these coyotes going way around, right with the parents, playing with their children there and not noticing. Those coyotes had figured out how to be just out of eye vision. It's always struck me as, a, as an image of things that we don't see that are just here on our periphery. But this is the beautiful thing about the Lord's Word, that thankfully the Lord is at hand opening our eyes to that which may be in our peripheral vision. And so the Lord opens our eyes to new possibilities, new attitudes, thoughts, and habits, and ones which promise to fill our lives with greater purpose and meaning. 
Now, it's true, we all get stuck in a rut sometimes. We stare at the proverbial four walls of our life, and nothing seems to shift, nothing seems to give. We find ourselves stuck in the same old thought patterns and attitudes, and our standard go-to answers about life's challenges and difficulties start to sound empty and hollow, even in our own ears. And we're told the hidden cause for this, that spiritually speaking, this happens when the influx of spiritual light or truth from the Lord gets interrupted or blocked by our own forgetfulness or busyness or by our own stubborn, selfish attitudes. You may remember at the time of the judges the phrase, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. To do what is right in our own eyes is to let ugly thoughts and feelings take root in our mind. It's to let our own justifications for why we do what we do become the norm, the excuse for why we don't change. To do what is right in our own eyes is to draw our own conclusions about right and wrong, who deserves our forgiveness and who does not. So we have this axiom in the book Divine Love and Wisdom that says thought from the eye closes the understanding, whereas thought from the understanding opens the eye. Our eyes are closed when we judge things according to the appearance. So the scriptures are full of these beautiful expressions about the Lord opening the eyes. Think of how many times with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah, they all lifted up their eyes. It's a strange expression, but we even sometimes need to lift up our eyes, looking down, lift them up. Elisha prayed to the Lord that his servant might see that he was not alone. Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the psalmist says, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things. So let us not get discouraged. Sometimes we don't see what we need to see because we simply aren't ready. We aren't ready to see the truth that the Lord wants to show us. We read in our reading this morning, so that we may be led from our old life to a new one, worldly passions must be cast aside and heavenly affections assumed. This is accomplished by countless means known only to the Lord. So only the Lord knows when we are ready to see something that we have been unable to see. And here's the beautiful thing. As the Lord changes our loves, as He does, our eyes are open to new things. I think we have all experienced this. As we get older, our tastes and our sensibilities change. Our priorities change. Our interests change. We have a better idea of what we want and don't want, what's right and what's wrong. And we start noticing things that we had never noticed before. The beautiful thing about this in terms of the Scriptures is that these truths that we start seeing that we hadn't seen before become the chief cornerstone of our life. And we say in prayer, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So in conclusion, let us remember that it is the Lord who gives us new eyes. There is so much more that the Lord wants us to see, and so He, as we read today, gifts us with a life that we previously did not have. And another teaching says that the Lord gifts us with new thoughts contrary 
to those we had had before. Blessed are your eyes, for they see. When the disciples asked the Lord why he spoke in parables, he answered by saying, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord ends by saying, blessed are your eyes, for they see. What the Lord has shown us in the new church is a privilege, a blessing. I think we all feel like we're standing on holy ground. So one big question is, what do we do with this new sight? The scriptures are full of these paradigm shifts which promise to dramatically change the way we look at things. You're familiar with them, going the extra mile, turning the other cheek, practicing the golden rule, living by the Lord's new commandment. And so as you pray for new eyes, remember that it is your spirit that is determining everything about you, what you say and do right now, what you think and feel right now, whether you smile or frown, whether or not you reach out with a helping hand, whether you choose to believe or not believe. And the point is your body is not making these decisions. It is your spirit. So think of a challenge you are facing right now and pray to the Lord for the ability to look at it with new eyes. Lord, open my eyes that I might see. And in time, you will start to see things you never saw before. Amen.